Hello and welcome to another video on basic fiber optics. Today I'm going to explain what four wave mixing is. So let's consider this setup right here where we have two lasers being merged inside of a coupler and then we, um, we split off part of the light and send it directly to an optical spectrum analyzer then take the other part of that light and send it into a optical fiber with a high nonlinearity, so basically a high length or long length and also a high gamma parameter which indicates nonlinearity as explained in my video on cell phase modulation and supercontinuum generation. So anyway, when we have these two distinct frequencies going in, how is the input field going to determine what the output field looks like? Well, let's think about it. So we can essentially write the input field like this. We have the, um, the first laser here and the second laser here where PA and PB are the the powers of the, the two lasers. Notice that we essentially expanded around a central frequency and that these two lasers have a frequency difference of omega d. So that's what I've tried to represent here in this little diagram. We have the frequency spectrum with the carrier or central frequency right here, then one laser right here and one laser here. It's based omega d apart in the frequency domain. Okay, I've been a little bit inconsistent here. This is f, which indicates proper frequency, and this is omega, which is angular frequency. But I think you, you get the idea. So let's think about what the output field is going to look like. Well, because we have a highly nonlinear fiber right here, we're going to get um, a phase modulation of the incident signal. So the output, output signal is going to be the input signal multiplied by complex exponential, where the, um, the phase depends on the gamma parameters, the inherent linearity, the length of the medium, as well as the power of the, um, of the, of the electric field. So if you think about it, the, okay, actually, uh, yeah, this should be okay. Okay, here I have a little bit of inconsistent notation. Technically, is that the electric field is more like the normalized electric field. But in any case, the point is that we'll see that the phase modulation on the incident field will depend on the power of that field. Well, what is the power of this field here going to be? Well, if we calculate it, we'll see that the power of the field is going to be equal to some offset here. And then we have this extra term here that oscillates as a, oscillates as a cosine function. And of course, essentially, these two laser frequencies are interfering, causing the optical power to vary like this over time. So now we have this interesting situation where we'll get a complex exponential with a cosine function inside of it. And if you remember the video I did on phase modulation, you'll remember that we can use something called the jacobi enger expansion to express this kind of funky structure with a cosine inside of a complex exponential as an infinite sum of frequency sideband spaced um, apart according to the omega d value right here. And where the strength of each sideband depends on the magnitude of the modulations. Essentially, in this case, m would be equal to 2 square root of pa times pb multiplied by gamma l like so. So if we apply this um, expansion to this expression right here, essentially what we get is um, an expression that tells us the power of each individual sideband here as a function of the input powers. And um, I'll skip the calculation for here, but actually you can, um, you can go and read my thesis, which should be linked in the description once it gets published. And then you can see the exact derivation getting from here to a description of what the power of each sideband here is. So essentially what happens is that as you, as you increase the powers of the input lasers, then these sidebands are going to grow stronger. You'll get more and more and more of them. So in principle, there's an infinite number of sidebands stretching in the positive and negative directions. But of course, the higher order ones are going to be too, too weak to actually really detect. Another interesting uh, feature is that the power of the nth order sideband would be proportional to integer powers of the input lasers. So in other words, if you, um, if you change the power of the input lasers, then this sideband here will respond much more strongly because it has a higher exponent right here. It will respond more strongly than some of the, the lower order ones. And that can also be used for a lot of interesting signal processing, which is what I explore in my thesis. But anyway, so four-way mixing is this nonlinear effect. And as you can probably imagine, this a bit, um, it's kind of useful and kind of interesting if you do nonlinear optics and want to generate like, more colors of light based on just two input colors, but it's kind of annoying if you're doing telecom because if you're trying to send data with these two wavelengths down the same fiber at the same time, then uh, what can happen is that data sort of get transferred between these two wavelengths because of this um, transfer of power that happens because of the the oscillation, the refractive index. And also you can generate like more idler data channels over here that can also sort of interfere with other uh, data communications. So in that case, it's not, not useful, but let's actually see in experimental detail how we can uh, we can observe this. Okay, let's see how I actually set up the experiment for observing four-way mixing. So right here we have pulses being generated by an EOM according to the same method I used in the uh, video about electro-optical modulators. These uh, pulses then go into this amplifier right here, which is 
connected to this polarization controller, which goes into this filter to remove all of the, the noise from the amplifier. And the output of this filter goes into a, um, a coupler right here. That coupler goes into an isolator, and the isolator goes into this 1 to 99 coupler. And here we actually split off a small amount of the, um, of the, the power so we can observe the spectrum before we send it into this nonlinear medium. Into the other part of that 50-50 coupler, we just have a continuous wave laser right here. And again, that goes into the, uh, the coupler, the isolator, and then into the, the nonlinear medium. And then I also measure the output of the nonlinear medium using the same optical spectrum analyzer here. So let us take a look at what actually happens if I activate the second trace. So what is in blue here, that's the input trace. We can see we have these just two lasers, and that's the only frequencies that are present. But if I turn this on and start sweeping, let me get this menu out of the way. Which at the moment is a little bit it's a little bit slow to do the measurements. So let me do this and then repeat it. Okay, so what we observe here is that you can see we still have the same frequencies right here that we sent in. But now we also have additional frequencies being generated here. And once again, what happens here is that the two lasers go into the nonlinear medium. And because the power is oscillating, you're sort of changing the refractive index sinusoidally, which means that you end up generating these frequency sidebands according to the Jacobi angle expansion. Now, one thing I might try here is actually to modify the polarization of the pulse laser a little bit, and we should be able to see that we actually gener generate another sideband down here. Let me see if we can get the angle just right. Ah, it simply disappeared again. It was kind of weak, so... Let me see. Can I turn it a bit more? Yeah, there we go. So now you can see we actually get this extra sideband being generated right here. So obviously you can see that this forward mixing procedure that I explained mathematically before, that was just a scalar explanation, but obviously um, the polarization of the laser light also plays a role because if the two lasers that are sent in are completely orthogonal, let's say one is X polarized and one is Y polarized, then they don't actually interfere and they don't modulate the effective index at all, and then you don't get any sidebands. So if you, if you tune the polarization to make sure that they're identical, then you get maximum sideband generation. And actually, in my thesis, something I explore is the exact relationship between the state of polarization you send in and the power of these sidebands are coming out and I use that in order to enhance the performance of uh, polarimetric fiber optic sensors. So basically fiber optic sensors that detect changes in polarization. So if I exploit the fact that higher order sidebands respond more strongly to change in polarization, then I can use them to measure a change with much more sensitivity. Anyway, I guess you can read that in the description if you're really, really interested. So anyway, that was just a quick explanation of four-way mixing. Stay tuned for more videos.